Thank you very much, Jim. I, uh... Hey, how you doing, man? I question... What do you know about foreign policy? What are you doing here? No, no, no. I don't know anything either, so we're both... We'll be in good company. There's a man I spent about, uh, one-third of my adult life with, uh, uh in the Judiciary Committee, uh, dealing with the Reagan administration, and a man who I have uh, an enormous regard for. Um, and he would be the first to tell you that, uh, it is only someone in Washington can say that someone who voluntarily commutes 250 miles a day for 24 years is normal. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, that's the highest compliment I've received in a long, long time. I, uh, I want you to know, and uh, I, I do appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be invited to speak to such a distinguished group. You hear that often stated, but it is true. You are a distinguished group, and uh, and uh, some of uh, you have uh, have been toiling uh, in this arena long before I've gotten involved, and almost all of you have been toiled in it with greater success than I have as long as I've been involved. And so I'm I'm, I'm grateful that you give me the opportunity to uh, to come and speak with you tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank you again, Admiral, for that kind introduction. And it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to, uh, to be in your company. For decades, uh, you've been, this entire organization has been a pillar of support for the North Atlantic Alliance. And uh, that support, in my view, uh, is now uh, uh, as important as it ever has been. Although I, as I'm going to attempt to outline tonight, I think some of you will be surprised to learn, I believe, uh, it is going to be very much in jeopardy uh, during this period of change and transition. My topic this evening, this evening is the enlargement of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to include several new democratic uh, Central European countries. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I propose to divide my talk, if you'll allow me, into two parts. First, to outline my support for enlargement, and I came to this somewhat more skeptical than most. And second, uh, uh, in addition to outlining uh, why uh, I support it, to, uh, to go on and go out on the limb and attempt to give you uh, a prognosis of senatorial attitudes and outcomes uh, on this issue uh, uh, as it unfolds uh, over the next year. Explaining the rationale for NATO enlargement to a group like this is uh, truly preaching to the choir, at least explaining the rationale for NATO has continued uh, vibrance is uh, preaching to the choir. I expect there's some division within this room about enlargement, A, whether we should, and B, if we should, how we should, and who should be uh, included. Uh, but uh, just so you know that uh, your elected representatives are not uh, um, plunging blindly forward, allow me to review some of the arguments against enlargement and then explain why I do not find them convincing. But I suspect you're going to hear these arguments much more loudly and forcefully articulated on the floor than I respectfully suggest any of you think. Um, the first of the arguments is that, and I believe the Senate, at least today, is basically divided into uh, three, three groups of senators on this issue. Those who uh, uh, who are, uh, uh, believe that NATO uh, is uh, not only has been, but continues to be essential to our security interest, and that it is not a question of whether or not it remains the same or expands, but does it expand or does it die? Um, and uh, uh, that basically is one group of which I count myself a member. There's a second group out there that says that NATO is important, NATO is important, Enlargement of it is not so important uh, because uh, we are applying, uh, in their view, a disproportionate share of our resources to Europe uh, and, uh, and that uh, we should begin to, uh, to reallocate uh, um, our resources in terms of our overall worldwide security interest and Europe is not the most important game in town anymore. And there's a third group who simply believe that, uh, uh, and there are a few in my party and a few more in the Republican Party, who are neo-isolationists who basically believe we should withdraw uh, from the world uh, in a whole range of uh, areas, uh, and not the least of which is NATO. And uh, 
And so the arguments that I will outline that I most often hear now in the cloakroom and hear now privately in my conversations with my colleagues sort of break down this way. One is that the Soviet Union is but a bad memory and no military threat is in sight in Europe, so why the hell do we have to do any of this? The second is the Pacific Rim has become the world's premier area for economic growth, so we shouldn't concentrate so many resources in Europe. We should be concentrating a significant larger portion of our resources in the Pacific Rim. The third is that Latin America, while also uh, a prime opportunity for trade investment, is more important than Europe to the United States because of our problems of illegal immigration and drug trafficking and other matters, and greater opportunities exist. As I pointed out in a recent trip when I was being lectured, as we always are, uh, by Europeans about why we have the obligation to do what we're doing. Uh, I happen to agree that they're right, but I don't like the lectures. Um, uh, I, I could not resist pointing out to one particular uh, uh, prime minister that uh, his country's population combined with all the other likely candidates did not equal that of Mexico and the consequences of trade opportunities with his country paled in comparison to Mexico, and he wasn't nearly as important uh, as Mexico. Uh, I still find myself trying to resist being as irreverent and as irrational, um, but I couldn't resist it because I got tired of the lecture. Um, uh, but the truth of the matter is an awful lot of my colleagues feel that very, very, very deeply. So when we make these trade arguments, when we make the security arguments, they look at Latin America and say, wait a minute, a hell of a lot more important what happens in Mexico than any of the countries you're talking about. And so um, the, uh, and the last argument I most often hear is NATO enlargement may assist the nationalist and the communist in Russia and draw new dividing lines in Europe. I will, uh, in one case, uh, it's, it's sort of the, uh, it'd be unfair to say the Kennan argument, but the, the, the notion of a new dividing line, and this is going to embolden um, all those forces in, the, uh, in Russia that we do not want to see emboldened. Uh, these are legitimate assertions that uh, I think have to be answered and will be the subject of debate on the Senate floor. I would submit, first of all, without minimizing the importance of Asia or Latin America, that Europe remains a vital area of interest for the United States for political, strategic, and economic and cultural reasons. A, a sizable percentage Many of the world's democracies are in Europe, and the continent remains a major global economic player and a partner of the United States. In economic terms, the European Union, with a combined population a third larger than ours, has a combined GDP that exceeds ours. And while the United States is a larger, and I might add, a less balanced trading relationship with Asia than with Europe, we invest far more in Europe. Several new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe uh, are, uh, are highly, have highly educated workforces, already boast rapidly expanding economies, and already attract considerable American investment. And moreover, most Americans trace their cultural roots to Europe, and millions retain personal ties to it. And by any geopolitical standard, it would be a catastrophe for the United States' interest if instability were to alter the current situation in Europe. Now, how might this instability occur? Well, no one that I know who is even mildly informed believes that the Russian army is uh, posed to pour through the Fulda Gap in Germany, NATO's horror scenario for the previous uh, 40 years. The Russian army is in such pitiful shape that couldn't even, uh, I, my, uh, obviously, could not even reconquer Chechnya as part of the Russian Federation. And so, no, uh, in my view, the threats to stability in Europe have changed, but they are, if anything, even more real than those of the Cold War. We all know what they are. They are the ethnic and religious hatreds, as horrifyingly shown in hundreds of thousands killed, raped, and made homeless and or otherwise brutalized in Bosnia. They're the well-organized forces of international crime, whose tentacles extend from Moscow to Palermo to New York to Los Angeles. And true, but some might ask why the Europeans can't take care of their own problems. Well, uh, life's not fair. And Europe, in my view, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, has not developed a degree of political maturation on the continent where they're likely to be able to settle their serious problems on the continent without 
without, at least an interlocutor, and in most cases, a very firm and strong voice from the United States. Unfortunately, the history of the 20th century has demonstrated that the United States must play a leading role in organizing the security of Europe. In World War I and World War II, and lately in Bosnia, without American leadership, the countries of Europe have been unable to resolve their differences peacefully. While American idealism has certainly played a role in our various interventions to rescue Europe, enlightened self-interest has been the dominant motive, I need not tell anyone in this room. Put simply, it's in the vital interest of the United States that stability be preserved in Europe in order for us to be able to play the constructive role in Latin America and in the Pacific Rim and the rest of the world. Now, how does this translate into 1997 terms? It means that we must lead Europe to create what is called in current policy jargon a new security architecture. President Clinton has a phrase he loves to use, and I think he's right. We are the essential nation. I see no reasonable possibility that a new security architecture is likely to be able to be created without the involved and firm hand of the United States. And it's needed, in my view, to guarantee the stability to the areas most vulnerable to disruption over the past 90 years. To no one's surprise, I'm talking about Central and Eastern Europe where newly independent states are striving to create and solidify political democracy and free market economies. And it's a very difficult process, which if not put into a larger framework could spin out of control. And I might note parenthetically, I happened to be with the Prime Minister of Romania today and he was talking about the economic changes that were made and how some in this country that he's visiting are indicating that they haven't done enough. And I said, well, as one politician to the other, let me remind, remind you, what you've done is remarkable. The question is whether it will last, whether the commitment is, is real and it will be sustained. But don't let anyone in this country lecture you. Here you have a country that's vibrant and healthy and growing, and Democrats and Republicans and a president couldn't even get together and agree to take the courageous step of recalculating the CPI that would impact uh, one half to one and one half percent on future growth of pension benefits in the United States. So tell when anyone starts to lecture you, uh, tell them to spare you the lecture and, uh, and uh, point to that, just as I hope you'll spare me the lecture about our obligation uh, uh, to you uh, um, uh, and, uh, and we reached an accord. Um, and uh, it's in this context of enlightenment of, that NATO must be seen, uh, I, I believe. During, World War, during the Cold War, NATO provided a security umbrella which former enemies like France and Germany were able to cooperate, under which former enemies like France and Germany were able to cooperate and build highly successful free societies. It was the framework in which uh, the former prize of, uh, like Italy and Germany and Spain, could be reintegrated into democratic Europe, and it was NATO that kept uh, kept the feud between Greece and Turkey from escalating into warfare. The enlargement of NATO, in my view, can, can now serve to move that zone of stability eastward to Central Europe, and thereby both prevent ethnic conflicts from escalating and forestall a, uh, a scramble for new bilateral and multilateral pacts along the lines of the 1930s from occurring. In fact, it's already happening. In anticipation of NATO membership, several Central and East European countries have recently settled long-standing disputes. I need only mention Hungary and Romania, Slovenia and Italy, Germany and the Czech Republic, Poland and Lithuania, Romania and Ukraine, and so on. If NATO were not, if NATO were not to enlarge, however, the countries between Germany and Russia, in my view, would inevitably seek other means to protect themselves. And the question for today is not, in my view, as I stated earlier, as is often assumed, enlarge NATO or remain the same. For the status quo is simply not an option, in my view. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one additional argument for NATO enlargement, which may have fallen out of fashion, and that is a moral one. For 40 years, the United States loudly proclaimed its solidarity with the captive nations of Central and Eastern Europe 
who were under the heel of the communist oppressor. Now that most of them have cast off their shackles, it's our responsibility to live up to our pledges, to readmit them into the West through NATO and the European Union when they're fully qualified. Ironically, within the fruits of NATO's unparalleled success lie the seeds for its possible demise. Alliances are formed to fight wars or to deter them. Once the adversary is gone, unless alliances adapt to meet changing threats, they lose their reason for being. Thus, enlargement, in my view, must be accompanied by a redefinition of NATO's mission. The alliance's primary mission, as outlined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty of April 4, 1949, remains the same treating an attack on one member as an attack on all, and responding through the use of armed forces if necessary. Now, in the current post-Cold War situation, non-Article 5 missions like peacekeeping, sometimes in cooperation with non-NATO powers, have become possible. The S-4 joint effort in Bosnia with Russia and several other non-NATO countries, I believe, is an excellent example of this. But what about our, our erstwhile adversary, Russia? I firmly believe that NATO enlargement need not adversely affect the U.S. relationship with Russia. I came to this conclusion on a trip to Moscow and several Central European countries earlier this spring. <clears throat> Although few Russians I found anywhere, from the think tank folks to the officials in power, although few Russians are fond of NATO enlargement, Policymakers in Moscow have accepted it. Moreover, no Russian politician with whom I met, from communist leader Zaganov to liberal leader Yavlinsky to nationalist leader Lebed, believed that NATO enlargement constitutes a security threat to their country. I did not find a single official, left, right, or center, who believed that to be the case. In fact, nearly all politicians, and I met with a number of members of the Duma as well, all politicians and experts with whom I met understood the non-aggressiveness implicit in NATO's three no's, the alliance's declaration of having no reason, intention, or plan in the current and foreseeable security environment permanently to station nuclear weapons or substantial combat forces of current members on the territory of new member states. They all understood that, and I don't think any of them doubted that with whom I spoke. Rather. The Kremlin's public opposition to enlargement, in my view, is largely a question of a psychological problem they are undergoing now, connected with the loss of empire, wounded pride, and most importantly, un uncertainty about Russia's place in the world of the 21st century. And were you in their spot, you would be the same, in my view, and I would. Where do they go? I had one interesting comment. Our conversation was a off, which was repeated with Levitt. They talked about they don't want this NATO expansion. They know it's not in their security interests and on and on. And said, well, and if you do that, we may have to look to China. And I couldn't help using the colloquial expression from my state by saying to Zaganov, lots of luck in your senior year. Um, you know, uh, good luck. And if, not, if that doesn't work, try Iran. Um, and uh, I'm serious. I said that to them. And these were very, and, and, and they know. I knew. They knew. Everybody knows that that is not an option. And everybody knows, every one of those leaders acknowledges and needs, and they resent it. But they need, they need to look west. And the question is, whether well, this is designed to completely shut them out, but not in terms of whether or not is a direct military security threat. Rather, the Kremlin's public opposition, as I said, is largely a psychological question and an uncertainty about its place in the world of the 21st century. As part of this uncertainty, most Russian leaders are worried about their country being marginalized. And as a result, they are eager to move forward with bilateral relations with the United States. And let's not kid ourselves. Never is a long time. And Russia's current weakened condition is sure to improve. And we, in my view, that means we must continue to in, engage Russia politically, militarily, and economically. The Clinton administration together with our NATO allies, has already begun to do this. Time does not permit me to go into detail, and most of you know the detail of the NATO-Russian Founding Act, signed at Paris. Except for me to say at this point that it's a good start at binding Russia closer to the West and soothing its bruised feelings without, without,
giving Moscow a decision-making role in NATO's core structure like the North Atlantic Council. The purely consultative mandate of the new NATO-Russia Joint Council, however, does not mean that it cannot evolve into a truly valuable mechanism for promoting mutual trust. As Russian officials better understand that NATO is not there, this rapacious caricature of the Soviet propaganda, but rather a defensive alliance and a force for security and stability in Europe, their animosity toward the organization may dissipate, and if we do it well, I believe it will. And by working together with the Joint Council, Russia can prove that it is a responsible partner for the West to continue to deal with. Through this mechanism and others, over time, Moscow can come to realize that enlargement of NATO by moving the zone of stability eastward to Central Europe will in fact increase Russia's own security. I have an expression that I often use in terms of domestic politics. I never tell another man his politics, so I don't presume to tell the Russian political leadership what they should think. But I truly believe that it is in Russia's interest for this zone of stability to be extended rather than nothing to happen. In order for NATO enlargement to proceed, though, both our current allies and the candidate countries invited to, jo to join at the M Madrid summit next month must agree, they must agree, the 15 other NATO nations and the three, if that's what the number is, four or five, and I believe it will be three, if the three nations are going to come in, they must agree to shoulder their fair share of the financial cost and all the mutual obligations that should be undertaken. This is not a sorority or fraternity. This is not a club. This is not a social undertaking. This is a serious, serious undertaking, as I need not tell a single person here. But I find among the populations and among the press and among academics in the countries I've visited, many of them are looking at this more in terms of their, their anchor in the West than anything having to do with any obligation they are contemplated undertaking, the financial cost, of undertaking the obligation or the military consequences. <laughs> Candidates for membership of NATO must assume the financial burden of making their armed forces interoperable with those of NATO members. In addition to meeting the cost of moderniz modernizing their militaries, which they must undertake in any event, other obligations exist. Other obligations are political and military, such as agreeing to come to the aid of allies, as described in Article 5, allowing basing of NATO troops on their territory if necessary, and allowing overflights of NATO aircraft if necessary. The February 1997 Pentagon study on, on NATO, <coughs> excuse me, proposed a distribution of direct cost of enlargement, whereby 15% would be in, assumed by the United States, 35% by the new members, and 50% by other current members of NATO. Calculating these ratios begins with the estimate that about 40 percent of the direct enlargement, excuse me, enlargement enhancement could be nationally funded and 60 percent common funded. Estimated direct cost of enlargement totaled between 9 and 12 billion dollars over 12 years through the year 2009. Let me point out the critical fact that according to the Pentagon plan, it is only these direct costs, these direct costs that the United States would help pay for. Additionally, costs not directly related to enlargement would have to be paid for by our current allies and our new allies. For example, our current allies must develop power projection capabilities, which the United States achieved in the 1980s, if they are to contribute to the new mission of the alliance. While these capabilities will allow them to help defend new members, they are necessary even if NATO were not to enlarge. It's estimated that they will cost eight to ten billion dollars over 12 years. Candidate countries must make the financial means available to modernize their forces and achieve interoperability within NATO if they expect current members to ratify their accession to membership. As I told one official in the country I will not mention because I don't want to get 500 letters, if you want to fly first class, I've kept being told everywhere, we want first class, first class membership. And I finally said to this military leader, if you want to fly first class, you have to buy a first class ticket. This is not a charity operation. The 
the uh, expected U.S. contribution to the direct cost of the enlargement of NATO are estimated at $150 to $200 million per year for 10 years if, if the 15 other NATO nations pick up 50 percent of the cost. A big if, in my view. Although a small fraction of our total national budget, it's nonetheless not trivial given our mandate to balance the U.S. federal budget by the year 2002. And that brings me directly to my second point, the second point of my talk, that is the prospects for Senate ratification of NATO enlargement. You may be surprised when I tell you, and I may be the only one to tell you, that I expect it to be an extremely difficult fight. Everyone else thinks it's going to be a cakewalk, so I hope I'm wrong. But the only thing I think most of the few of you who know me here know, I may not be good at much, but I ain't bad at knowing the Senate. After 24 years, I figured it out. And I'm telling you, I think it's going to be one hell of a fight. Moreover, even if the Senate ratifies enlargement, I have grave worries about the continued American commitment to NATO in the coming years, unrelated to enlargement. My reasons for pessimism revolve around three sides of the same issue, burden sharing. The first side relates to the sharing cost of NATO enlargement. The second side relates to sharing military duties in Bosnia. And the third relates to the European Union's foot dragging, in my view, on its own enlargement into Central and Eastern Europe. First, the cost. I fear that the 50 percent share of direct enlargement cost allocated to the Western European NATO partners in Canada may be politically more difficult than the 35 percent allocated to the new members particularly after our current allies pay for their own power projection enhancements. To be blunt, the Europeans face a number of competing priorities. Eleven European NATO members, who are also members of the European Union, are currently engulfed in a painful budget cutting in order to meet the Maastricht Convergence criteria for economic and monetary union on January of 9, 1 of 1999. Those countries who qualify may be held to rigid fiscal discipline thereafter. And if a stability pact is enforced without so-called political criteria, there's a problem. Resentment against this belt tightening played a key role in the defeat of President Chirac's coalition in the French elections on June the 1st. As a politician, I, uh, I empathize with the challenge our European friends face. But we all have to make difficult choices. And if our European allies want continued American involvement in their security, they're going to have to step up to the plate. In order for NATO remain, to remain a vibrant organization with the United States continuing to play the lead role, the non-U.S. members must assume their fair share of the direct enlargement cost and for developing power projection capabilities in the environment in which they now find themselves. To do otherwise would cast the United States in the role of the uh, the good gendarme of Europe, a role that uh, neither the American people nor the Senate of the United States, I believe, would be willing to accept. Above and beyond enlargement, <clears throat> unless our European allies significantly upgrade their militaries, a strategic disconnect between a technologically superior United States military and a technologically outdated Western European militaries will make it impossible for NATO to function as it has in the past 40 years. My sentiments have been voiced by several of my colleagues, including some who do not share my passionate commitment to continued American involvement in Europe. As co-chairman of a rather unwieldy group of 28 senators known as the Senate NATO Observer Group, Senator Roth is the chairman. I want you to know NATO enlargement is going to be decided in Delaware. It's an all-Delaware deal. Uh, um, but uh, last week, all kidding aside, this group met with the President of the United States, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and one of the Deputy Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I assure you I'm not betraying any confidence or national secrets when I tell you that the President, Vice President, and others got an earful from my colleagues. From uh, some of our group, uh, they got an earful, those who feared dilution of NATO's effectiveness by adding new members. A surprisingly large number of that group voiced that concern, either asserted it was going to happen or voiced a concern it may. From some who uh, had up to, uh, uh, had it up to here with uh, European allies uh, not pulling their weight in their opinion. I think that was the phrase used, had it up to here. From some who uh, uh, reminded us that six of the seven largest armies of the world are in Asia, not in Europe from some who pointed out that 
Northeast Asia and South Asia, not Europe, are <clears throat> the two areas of the world where nuclear conflict is most likely to break out. And from still others, from just one or two, who just were plain tired of the United States being responsible for, as one of them said, 911 calls from around the world. <laughs> My friends, we're in for a real fight. And a group of some of the most important and influential senators just came back from a recent trip to Brussels. And I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm confident I'm not saying anything I shouldn't. When I say Ted Stevens, one of the most informed people, one of the people who heretofore has been most committed to NATO, is gone from not certain to skeptic to almost, I don't know this for sure, I can't say it for certain, but as he buttonholed me, he said, you know, everything you said about what I say is right. And we, I'm telling you, I'm not, this is a bad idea. Now, what bad idea he is referring to, I wasn't sure. But I believe he means the expansion of NATO. So this is not a rump group of uninformed people who haven't been involved in foreign policy matters who are going to say, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea. I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see some real spirit of debate. And as if this weren't going to be enough trouble, <clears throat> there is a second dark cloud looming on the horizon of European-American relations. And that is, in the late spring of 1998, just when the Senate is likely to be voting on amending the Washington Treaty to accept new members, American ground forces will be completing their withdrawal from Bosnia, as announced, and I believe it should have never been announced, but I am in a minority of about three in the United States Senate. I mean, I'm not exaggerating that. I don't think they're, I understand why the administration did what they did. If they hadn't, they probably would have been overwhelmed by two efforts I was able to help successfully stop being legislated in the Senate, setting a drop dead date as a matter of legislative law, of, as a matter of legislation. But nonetheless, notwithstanding the fact I think it's a bad, bad idea for us making that announcement and that judgment ahead of time, I do think the politician in me tells me that it's likely to happen. I don't know how the boy gets out of this one. I don't know how he moves from this one. And I'm being a bit facetious, obviously, but I don't know how we get off of this. And it's going to occur at the very time, at the very time we're going to be voting on whether or not to amend the treaty. As it now stands, our European allies <clears throat> will follow suit, repeating the in-together, out-together mantra. Despite the U.S. offer to make air, naval, communications, and intelligence assets available to a European-led follow-on force, with an American rapid reaction force on standby alert over the horizon in Hungary or in Italy. Many of my colleagues, mindful of the uh, now, the repeated calls by some European NATO members led by France for more European leadership in the alliance and a sturdier European pillar in NATO will see in the European refusal to maintain, maintain troops in Bosnia evidence of an equitable burden sharing, or worse still, will have doubts about the worth of NATO in the first place. I might note parenthetically, some of you are tired of hearing me say this, I've been a broken record for five years. Failure to move more enlightened way, in my view, on Bosnia did more damage to the likelihood of the United Nations being able to play a significant role in our foreign policy calculations and NATO's long-term viability than anything that's happened in the last five years. But the point here is very basic, and I'm sure you fully understand it. I have a friend I went to high school with, a very bright guy. He's, uh, he has what they call street smarts. And I'll sometimes say to him, I say, Bob, now do you understand what I mean? And he'll look at me and say, Joe, I not only understand, I overstand. <laughs> well, I'm sure you all overstand the point that I'm making, but it bears repeating. It bears repeating in terms of the political context in which this battle is going to take place. That's why I might add, Parenthetically, that, that I have given unsolicited advice worth what they have paid for to the Secretary of State, to the President, the National Security Advisor, that instead of spending time up in the United States Senate trying to convince these erstwhile, these, the, these way, wayward members about whether or not to vote for enlargement, they should be spending time in the European capitals making sure that 50% number is really going to be forthcoming. And they should be spending time in European capitals trying to work out 
some kind of accommodation. So it's not all in, all out. And it's not an easy mission, I might add. I'm not suggesting that just to go say it means it can be done. But that's where I'd be spending my capital and my energy, were I the Secretary of State or the President, rather than up on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> the French position in Bosnia, if you pardon the pun, I find particularly galling, <laughs> considering, <laughs> considering their insistence on a European command of armed forces south of Naples. As you know, AF South is the home of the Sixth Fleet, and no matter how Paris tries to dress it up, senators perceive this demand as a gratuitous poke in the eye, aside from the fact that it's a non-starter of an idea. It contributes to poisoning the atmosphere, particularly since our German allies, as usual, have at least formally supported the French, although privately I doubt they agree at all. The final matter concerns the enlargement of the European Union. From the early 1990s, the EU firmly proclaimed that NATO enlargement had to precede EU expansion if a session two years ago of Austria, Finland, and Sweden is accepted with an E. I'm well aware of the, uh, the complexity of uh, melding the political, economic, uh, and to some extent the social systems of divergent countries into, in EU language, an ever closer union. But many observers, and not a few of my colleagues, suspect that to some extent the EU has yielded to domestic pressure groups like the farmers and has used NATO enlargement as a convenient way to postpone the admission of Central and Eastern European countries. To put it crudely, for now, NATO should have to serve, uh, for now, NATO should serve as a poor man's EU. And that's where I think they're looking, how many of our European allies are looking at it. Now uh, that NATO has uh, set 1999 date for completion of the first round of enlargement, the EU should move ahead with its own expansion. And the first round target date of two 2002 has been cited and should be met. In the meantime, as President Clinton advocated three weeks ago in The Hague, <coughs> Western governments and private enterprises should cooperate on, on investment mechanisms to assist the economies of the new democracies to move rapidly forward. This may sound uh, simplistic, but, uh, but uh, likely attempts at unequal cost sharing of NATO enlargement, unwillingness for a rational division of labor in Bosnia after mid-1999, and the slow-go policy of EU, EU expansion, which would greatly benefit Eastern Europe, all seem to many senators to be variants of taking the United States for suckers. So how about my prognosis? Well, I think the debate will be lively, occasionally raw, but necessary. I think that in the end, it will be very difficult for most of my colleagues to vote against admitting the Poles, the Czechs, and the Hungarians into NATO. But I also believe that unless we quickly come to a satisfactory burden-sharing understanding in all its facets with our European and Canadian allies, the future of NATO in the next century will be very much in doubt. And let me conclude by saying many of us here came from, through, and were involved in what is referred to now as, seems like 100 years ago, that Vietnam era and the Vietnam generation. We could all argue what lessons we should or should not have learned from Vietnam. But I suspect there's one most of us would agree on, and that is that no foreign policy, regardless of how well-fashioned and how brilliantly laid out, can be sustained without the informed consent of the American people. The informed consent of the American people. Thus far, the American people have not only not been asked to give their consent, they have not been informed as to the cost and obligations and benefits of expanding. And so I truly believe that although this debate will be rambunctious at times, ill-informed at times, it will also be abs the absolute precondition for the ability of the United States to sustain its commitment to NATO as it is or expand it. And I believe once the case is made to the American people, they will sign on. But I want to make it real clear to everybody here that <clears throat> as we vote, there will be few senators who will vote no on Poland. But I want to make sure when they vote yes, they also raise their hand and say, and I understand that commits me for the next 10 years to appropriate another couple hundred 
million dollars a year. Because the worst of all worlds, in my view, is expand NATO and then end up in the kind of debate we had for the last five years about the United Nations, whether or not we should pay, withholding our commitment. That will, unlike the UN, which can and did bumble along, and I don't, and I say that critically, but bumble along for the past five or six years, NATO will not do that. And so we have to be prepared for all those who talk about and ultimately vote for the inclusion of these three new nations, the most likely candidates, that they have signed on and have told their constituents that they're going to have to pay and that they will vote to pay. I said there was a last thing. There's actually one more. <laughs> I wrote a report, which any of you who have insomnia um, uh, might, uh, I brought along, it's presumptuous of me to do this in this group, but I brought along copies of the report. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time on it with Dr. Hotzel when we came back. I, um, and I point out two things, as I pointed out to each of the each of the candidate states, and I met with the heads of state of every one of them, every major elected political official in each of those countries. It was clear to me after the first day that none of the countries in question had any clear notion of the cost to them. None of them, none of them had any clear notion of the cost to them. With some good reason, because it had, the missions had been not outlined to them. They had not been invited. I'm not being critical. I'm just making a statement of fact. As of four weeks ago, not a single solitary country of the four that I visited, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovenia, had any clear notion of the cost, the financial cost to them. And notwithstanding the fact there are public opinion polls in Poland particularly that overwhelmingly support NATO, I repeatedly asked the question, when you are making these significant cuts in an antiquated military to accommodate the expansion needed within the military, do your people have any notion of the social cost and consequences of those decisions for you? And I pointed out again, we have a base closure commission, folks, in a healthy, vibrant, oldest democracy <coughs> in the world. And it is wrenching. It is a wrenching political undertaking. These nations are going to be asking their constituencies to make some very difficult choices. And so I am equally as emphatic with our, the states we're likely to invite to join that they, as they say, take the show on the road to make it clear that they are willing and able to meet the commitments that will be required. Because again, let me conclude where I began. This is not a social club. This is not a feel-good organization. This is not something that's designed to reinforce people's sense of security. It's real, live, vibrant, important, and critical. And there are prices to be paid for membership. But I think the benefits for them as well as us far outweigh the cost in enlargement of NATO. I thank you very much, and with your permission, I thank you. We uh, said we would go till 7.30, and that's about 25 minutes from now, so uh, the Senator will take uh, your questions till then. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, John Karch, uh, Slovak World Congress. Among other things, I write for a Slovak American paper, and when you introduced uh, your amendment uh, for membership to Slovenia, I, after the article appeared, I had a number of calls that uh, Senator Biden misspelled Slovakia. And I, I assure them uh, uh, he did not. Uh, did you? <laughs> no, I did not. I, I, I know the answer. Uh, however, I, uh, seriously, I do, this is true. Uh, but I do want to ask you, and you mentioned Slovenia again that you had visited. What happened? The Senate accepted your amendment unanimously, I believe, but the administration let you down with uh, Slovenia. And what about other countries? And is there a timetable for ongoing membership? 
The answer to the question is twofold. One, the administration did, which is not always the case with Democrat or Republican administrations, did consult with us along the way and up front. I need not tell anyone in this room there is a good deal of divergence within Europe about who and when and how quickly. The combination, it seemed quite frankly at the end of the day, the choice was not three or four, it was three or five, or maybe three or five plus something. And the conclusion that was reached by the administration, and I cannot quarrel with it, because I'm not the one in Bonn or in, I, I, I'm not the one in Paris or London doing the negotiating. I cannot quarrel with it. It seems to me that uh, um, the administration, uh, if the choice was three or five or more now, made the right choice for two reasons, for two reasons. I think it should have been four. It should have been easy. It would have been, but that's a different question. The reason I think they in, made the right choice, if we move beyond Slovakia, the ability to connect with the American people in the Senate on this enlargement issue diminishes. Uh, did I say Slo I, Slovakia? I'm back, let, me, let, me back, let me restate. Uh, because maybe I did say it the wrong way. If we move beyond Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovenia, a country of two million people, if we move beyond that, as pointed out by two of my colleagues in the meeting with the President, the consensus in the Senate for enlarging NATO becomes, is put more in question. The American people understand the moral, historical, and cultural commitment they have to Poland because there's so many American Poles. They understand about Hungary in 1956. They have a memory about these countries. And they have a commitment that can be, in my view, can be awakened and can be justified and can be mentioned. As we expand the number, as two of my colleagues said, and to be honest with you, I had not thought of this, the ability to generate that kind of consensus diminishes. Now, that leads to the second question, though. Does that mean that there's only going to be one round? The answer to that question is absolutely no. Because I think once they've made the judgment that expansion is necessary as a consequence of the arguments and the integration takes place, then I think the second and third rounds become much easier. Now again, this is a tactical question. This is a judgment question. I do not presume to suggest to you what I'm suggesting the administration suggested their variant is, in fact, absolutely right. No one in this room knows. But part of the calculation was reception by the Senate. Part of the calculation was reception by our European allies. And part of the calculation was uncertainty about the readiness of the other countries Europeans were pushing in terms of whether or not they have already met the Perry principles and whether or not the changes that have been undertaken are as real or as permanent as they are presently real. So the conclusion, spurred on by the Joint Chiefs, I might add, was three, even though some of us argued vociferously that it be four. But that, I don't think, is a real option. And to be honest with you, as I came back from Slovenia, it was pretty clear to me after meeting with some of my French friends and others that it was not likely to be um, uh, Slovenia without uh, one or more in addition. And so I think you're asking me, I don't know what went into the mind of the president in making the final decision. My guess is, my guess is, my educated guess is, it's the issues that I've just raised. Receptiveness in the Senate, receptiveness in Europe, and the option being not three or four, but three or five or three or six or seven, along with cost. Yes, sir. Tom Hudson's with the Association to Unite the Democracies. It just seems to me that there are two good reasons for bringing Slovenia in. One, it creates a land path to Hungary. Hungary's going to be out there isolated. Uh, number two, it 
uh, is an example for the other Yugoslav nations that maybe they can get in if they straighten up. Sir, I uh, am not being solicitous when I say this. Precisely the argument I've made to the president, precisely the argument I've been making. Frick, let me be. Let me put a finer point on it. I think that the situation in Croatia is dangerous right now. I think Mr. Tuzman is. I'll just say blunt. Is no box of chocolates. I. Uh, I think that the road that Croatia is moving down is potentially disastrous. And I think that Slovenia being admitted now would do precisely what you said. Indicate that there is a path to the West that is tied directly to positive democratic action and settling your disputes with your neighbors. So I think it would have been very, very strong. Secondly, I do not think, sir, bringing in Slovenia would have had the encirclement argument, you know, we're going to encircle, we're going to enhance the, 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 uh, the indecision and the anxiety and the anger in Russia, et cetera. Bringing in Slovenia would have been a non I mean, it would not have even have registered on the Richter scale. And thirdly, um, I think the, geo, the, ge the geographic point you made is a real one, although I think in the near term it's not of much consequence in terms of its, uh, its actual practical military uh, efficacy. Um, but for all the reasons you stated, plus some you have not stated, I thought it would have been the wisest thing to do. Let me, you didn't ask this, but let me add something. I did ask the President in this last meeting whether notwithstanding the fact that Slovenia may not be at it, Romania will not, may not be at it, and so on whether or not the president would view it as helpful or hurtful if some of us in the Senate, upon the decision having been made in Madrid, and assume for the moment, and I don't know this obviously, but assume for the moment the decision is what we all anticipate, the so-called big three, would it be helpful or hurtful to the president of the United States, to, our, to the United States, for me or others to introduce a resolution in the Senate saying that we hoped and expected that the next round would come quickly and that Romania and Slovenia would be the first two on the list. And the answer, interestingly enough, was it would be helpful, not hurtful. So there is no question in my mind that the second will come. There will be a second round, assuming the first is successfully negotiated, which I believe ultimately it will be. Ultimately it will be. Also, today in my discussions with the Prime Minister of Romania, as many of you know very, very well, I mean, I feel kind of silly even saying these things, you all know them so well, uh, the Prime Minister is seeking, Romania is seeking, that there be an official communique at Madrid. That raises other questions, difficult questions, about whether or not it's a, who you leave out. I'm kind of, I teach constitutional law on Saturday mornings at Warden University Law School, a course on separation of powers, and I'm always, we start this separations course by trying to explain uh, how we came about uh, this old <coughs> constitution, and it wasn't like it came right after the revolution. There was a thing called the Articles of Confederation for a while, and all those boys who met up there in Philadelphia, they sat down and they all were instructed that, by the way, go try to work it out, but no new deal. No new deal in this. No, no new document. Everybody forgets they were ordered by their state legislators, no new document. So how did it happen? How did it get there? Well, and then I talk about this issue about this, about a Bill of Rights. And the big argument, and the Ninth Amendment was supposed to satisfy, although Judge Bork doesn't agree with me, um, uh, was whether or not by mentioning certain rights, you were implying that the rest of the rights were not reserved to the people. Well, that's kind of where we are when we start naming. We start naming future admittees. What about the Balts? What about a lot of other countries who may or may not, or are, are seeking admission? So uh, um, I think the answer lies in one, the Senate going on record, and two, a robust effort on the part of the administration to further enhance bilateral relationships with the country seeking admission, particularly through the Partnership for Peace. 
because I think what is going to be needed most is an assurance that you're still in the game. You're still in the game and mean it. Um, and, uh, but this is not going to be an easy process. I, I, again, I need not tell any of you that, but it's not going to be easy. Yes, General. Senator, uh, I, I agree 100% with your uh, <laughs> prepared remarks, and we've not always agreed on 100%, uh, uh, as you You're know. You're starting to lose your reputation. <laughs> You're the reason we have a chemical weapons treaty, and, uh, um, and you are agreeing with me now. I, I, I will, as Jim Eastland said, when I once asked him, he said to me, he said, boy, he said, what would Jim Eastland do for you in Delaware? And I said, what do you mean, Mr. Chairman? He said, if I campaigned for it, what would it do? I said, well, some places you'd help and some places you'd hurt. And he looked at me, swear to God, true story, and he looked at me and said, well, boy, I'll come and campaign for you or against you, whichever helped the most. Um, <laughs> so if you'd like me to say bad things about you, General, I'll say them, but I don't mean them. You no. uh, the, 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 uh, the thing I'd like you to elaborate on more is with this persuasive argument that uh, you've made and, and say with which I agree completely, you know, why uh, are you pessimistic about the uh, outcome? Why, why the opposition? Is it cost? Uh, Two things. Are there General. other things that, that uh, must be overcome? I think it's cost, resentment, resentment, which is an, a big factor. I think we underestimate it, and priorities. There literally are a new generation of, look, I, I, I find this bizarre I, that I'm talking about a new generation, um, but it's painfully true. There is a new generation of leadership in the United States Senate that's come in, mostly new members west of the Mississippi, who generally they don't look to Europe. They look in every way east. They look, they, they are conditioned as my generation was. We were all, we were all Anglophiles who looked to Europe uh, beyond England. I mean, it was, I mean, it was part of our, you know, Eastern liberal education. Well, that ain't the case today. That is not the case today. And the newer members, particularly, particularly from the Midwestern and Western states, their economies of their states are tied much more to Asia than they are to Europe. They look west, not east. I know you probably think that's an exaggeration, but I, I, I'm not joking about that. Or they look south and tie that to this resentment that exists, this resentment that they don't quite understand why, why. You know, let me back up. A lot of you, all of, many of you knew Hubert Humphrey. First time I ever went to Europe, I went with Hubert Humphrey, Clifford Case, Jack Javits, Mike Mansfield. And I went to the Ditchley House, the Ditchley Foundation, in that magnificent old estate of, of uh, Robert E. Lee. And we sat in that library, how you know it well, with all those deer hanging in the wall with expressions written under their, uh, 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 anyway, fascinating place. And I sat there, and it was an Atlantic Alliance meeting. And I sat there as the young 30-year-old senator, and I just listened to these people. And at the end of the three-day conference, Dennis Healy, who was a very, very close friend of, uh, believe it or not, this is an answer, General, um, a very, very close friend of, uh, of, of uh, Hubert Humphreys, they we started to engage in, as all the Brits do, rye toast. I mean, we're going to have like 50 toasts at this concluding dinner. And the concluding toast, after Hubert Humphrey got up and, and just really went after Dennis Healy in a humorous way, Healy who was uh, 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 quite, a, quite a good after-dinner speaker, stood up and toasted Hubert Humphrey, and he said, and let me conclude by saying what, what uh, um, uh, Winston once said immediately after becoming PM. And I may get the names wrong here, but this is my recollection. He said, Winston Churchill was at the box making an important point and case, and all of a sudden a young backbencher in his own party stood up and excoriated Churchill. And I believe the name was Soames, but I'm not certain of that. No, no, <laughs> I don't know who it was. Well, let me just say Smith. And old Smith stands up and excoriates Churchill. And Churchill allegedly looked across the aisle or next to him, but the name that was intoned was at least said, Clement, I don't know why Soames says that of me. I never did a favor for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's an, whoever said it, it shows great insight into human nature. 
And I think what's happening now is every European leader knows the truth of what we all know, that they desperately need and want us to remain active and involved in Europe, even the French, as Barry Goldwater would say, in their heart, they know we're right. <laughs> but, but, I cannot underestimate for you, overestimate for you, the impact upon my colleagues of the lectures, of the flagellation, of the moralizing that they get when they visit European capitals. And they come back angry. I mean that sincerely. You think I'm joking. I am not. They come back angry. And so I just think, General, it cannot be underestimated, the sense of resentment and, and, you know, it's kind of an irony. There was, a, there was a, a major poll recently done. Why is it that with the economy booming like it hasn't in 50 years in a sustained fashion, why is it with unemployment the lowest it has been and, and inflation the lowest and the combination of all those factors as good as, why are Americans still pessimistic when you ask them about their own circumstance? And I believe part of this is that Americans are feeling sorry for themselves right now. They feel put upon. They feel as though we are the only ones left standing. We're the ones in their minds that are always asked to do everything, whether it's true or not. I believe that's the feeling. And it is reflected in their, elect in their representative, elected representatives. And so when the Europeans with economies as strong, as vibrant, as real, as ours, in terms of their long-term stability, come along and tell us about our obligation. They get very angry. I'll give you a specific example. I was in one country in question. I asked one of the, I believe it was the deputy foreign minister of this country. The foreign minister was there as well. And I believe the chairman of their equivalent of the Joint Chiefs was there. And I was asked, how are you going to pay for the ride, the ticket? Because that's the phrase they were using. And they said, oh, our economy is growing at 6 to 7% a year. And we're going to do this, that. And then we are going to raise $100 million a year for allowing your forces to exercise in our country. <laughs> now, that's the God's truth. I'm not joking. I am not joking. And I said, well, uh, well you know, um, uh, I think, I, I, I'm not joking about this. I said, I think that will be a big problem. <laughs> and this particular, this particular deputy foreign minister said, but it's only, and he came up with a percentage, one half of 1% or whatever of your military budget. And you have an obligation. And we are going to provide more security. And I, so I avoid getting letters. I will not mention the country. I looked at this person. I couldn't resist and said, now let me ask you a question. How many Americans do you think when I go home and say, your army is protecting their security, are going to sleep more soundly the next night? Well, he didn't quite understand that until I said that. And he said, well, what's the problem? And I said, the problem is, that's not the way to sell, make your case. Americans are tired of hearing this. I heard as recently as today. Well, my people expect you to keep your commitment. We've been waiting for the Americans to come for 50 years. I mean, literally, that, that was the exact quote. Now, it's true they have been. It's true we've said we were. But it is not true that the American public is going to say, Golly, we got our chance now. <laughs> Let's go do it. And the other part of it, General, is just like I'm sitting in each of those capitals as you have, General, and you've forgotten more about this than I'm going to learn. And not a single one of the countries seeking admission feel the least bit threatened at this moment. Not a single one. And I try to make the case to them. I said, wait a minute now. You don't feel threatened. Why do you think the American people, after you tell them their obligation, are going to rush to the opportunity to spend another couple hundred million bucks a year? And if you don't feel threatened, why should they feel threatened? 
Well, it is, it is understandable. All this is understandable. It's the politics of existing. But it is very corrosive. And that's why the last point, General, is the reason I fear the debate the most, is that if the Europeans and those countries seeking admission do not forthrightly acknowledge to their people the cost for them and the price they will have to pay if they expect us to pick up a disproportionate share, this place will not swallow it. And it would be a tragic mistake. A tragic mistake. But you know, I went to a, I went to a Catholic school and as it will sh shock you all, I often got in trouble. And the nuns used to make you, when you misbehaved, write on the board after school. 500 times or 300 times, it's usually for me 500. The following phrase, several phrases, but one I remember because I've written it thousands of times. <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And the good intentions of all our friends who will tell us about our obligation may very well help pave the road to hell, which is that it could bring about this worst case. I don't expect it, but I'm telling you, it's going to be a major part of the debate. You may recall, General, or maybe you weren't there, but I made a case to the President and a number of other people. I said, you are misplacing your concern. Your concern is whether or not the center and the right in this country are going to rebel against a NATO Russian charter. I predict that that would not be the problem. The problem is going to be burden sharing. That's going to be the problem. And that's why I think, General, it will be a difficult debate. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Harun Kazaz, Turkish Probe Magazine. Sir, I'm so glad you added your uh, uh, speech or well, point I'm with burden sharing. I'm, I'm delighted to that. Uh, I want to continue on the burden sharing. Yes. A southern flank of uh, Europe, uh, uh, NATO, as in the case of Turkey, is expecting their threat, immediate threat, coming from different direction than that of Central or Eastern Europe, or even in the case of Russia. While they have limited resources for their defense, how should their uh, politicians explain to their people, spend their money where there is no threat is, uh, at this point, while they're expecting the threat from elsewhere? So how should they really honestly get up and say, yes, I will 100% share the burden, whatever it is, comes to my direction? Uh, two ways. I, and I, again, I said at the outset, I never tell another man his politics. So I will answer the question by saying, were I, were I a Turkish official? the way I would, or were I working for a Turkish official, the way I would recommend my boss to respond. I would say one answer is going to be a bit, to use the American slang, a bit flippant, and the other answer is very sincere. The first answer is the sincere answer, and that is that that's why we have to redefine the mission of NATO. The redefinition of NATO's mission and rationale for being has to in part be to be, have a capacity and a consensus to deal with something other than, historically, we have only the European theater. That's number one. And that's right, direct my energies. And the second, I would say, save money by withdrawing your troops from Cyprus um, and uh, uh, bring them home. I mean that sincerely. I am not joking about that. Um, uh, but then again, um, I am not likely to win any awards uh, for popularity in Turkey. Um, and. Uh, nor many other countries, uh, but, but I'm sincere. I really mean that. I think it is the festering boil that should be lanced for the sake of Turkey, for the sake of Turkey, as well as for Cyprus. I really do. At any rate. Sir, um, uh, if I could exercise a prerogative of the chair and ask, I think Susan Eisenhower has one uh, question as a, to close off. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much for your presentation. I just uh, thought there was one other piece of unfinished business. You said earlier in your uh, discussion, well, what about the Baltics? Well, what about the Baltics? If you could tell us what their prospects are for expanding. What about the Baltics and what are their prospects? Their prospects are real but more distant. 
Um, and I think this is me and only me speaking, not speaking for the administration or anyone else in the United States Congress. And, uh, and uh, I, I obviously, to state the obvious, I could be dead wrong about this. I think the one place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term for admission, having nothing to do with the merit and preparedness of the country to come in, would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO-Russian, U.S.-Russian relations. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction, I don't mean military, in Russia, it would be that. So the way I look at the calculus here, Ms. Eisenhower, is as follows. I believe, and I once was told that uh, to be in this business, you must be an optimist. So some would suggest this is too optimistic of you. I believe time, time meaning in the next several years, will solve this. To the degree to which Russia becomes comfortable with, and it has demonstrated that, the enlargement of NATO is not only not in their interest, but ultimately in their interest in, in expanding stability, is the degree, the degree to which the accession of the Baltics into NATO becomes a reality. I think there's a correlation between the two. And so it is my expectation, as well as my hope, that in the near term, meaning by the end of this century or shortly thereafter, the Balts will be admitted to NATO if they still are seeking admission to NATO. I expect they will be. I expect they will be. So there seems, to me at least, in the calculus, to be a correlation between the two. If we do the first piece well, then the second piece becomes inevitable, in my view. Now, there are others who will suggest that that is not the case and we should move for immediate admission of the Baltics. That will also cause some real difficulty within Europe. One of the things everybody forgets is we've got to get 16 votes, including 15 plus ours. 15 plus ours. So to use an old phrase that was used all during the 60s and 70s that maybe is ironically relevant today. There, is, there are confidence building measures that are going to be undertaken as a consequence of this accession process. So in my view, they can and will be admitted. In my view, it relates though to the calculus of how well we do the first piece and the reaction and the continued democratization and market economy in Russia. I thank you all very, very much for allowing me to speak to you.